This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidoyot. It's Wednesday, September 4th. This is Africa 54. Pope Francis begins a three-nation tour of Africa with a historic visit to Mozambique. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa condemns a wave of xenophobic looting and violence. And meet the nine-year-old Nigerian whiz kid who has built over 30 mobile games. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is condemning days of widespread looting and arson attacks against foreign-owned businesses across Johannesburg and Pretoria. He calls the violence totally unacceptable. In a video published Tuesday on Twitter, President Ramaphosa said South Africa cannot tolerate attacks on people from other African countries. Police fanned out across neighborhoods in Johannesburg and Pretoria as the violence extended into a third day. Police have arrested more than 30, more than 90 people in five areas impacted by the violence. Many damaged and looted shops remained closed as shop owners, many of them foreign, feared returning to their property. To check the shops, everything is, everything has been looted. Even as you can see here, the fridge, uh, everything uh, stocks. Nothing we have now. No, we have no choice. So the people, even now, we are scared even to come this side. South African grocer ShopRite Holding said on Wednesday several stores in its home markets of Nigeria and Zambia were closed and extensive damage had been done to several supermarkets over the past 24 hours. Nigerians living in South Africa expressed fear of losing their lives and property. Some of the Nigeria, angry Nigerian youths, you know, hurriedly went into the shop right because of what has been happening and the large number of Nigerian youth has been killed in South Africa. And people's buildings and properties are being bought down as we speak. So we have to come here when the whole incident ha started happening. And we've been here. Police have been trying to take control of the place and try to also protect the property that belongs to the same people. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari says he is dispatching a special envoy to meet President Ramaphosa to secure the safety of Nigerian citizens and property. Now hundreds of mainly female students protesting about violence against women tried to storm a conference center in Cape Town where the World Economic Forum conference was being held, but they were stopped by a heavy police presence. Loren Anthony reports take notice of gender-based violence. That was the message from students and activists demonstrating outside the World Economic Forum in Africa on Wednesday, hosted at the Cape Town Convention Center. The group demanding to be addressed by President Cyril Ramaphosa were blocked by police as they attempted to enter the building. Their rage sparked by the rape and murder of a University of Cape Town student who was declared missing last week. After a nationwide search, her suspected rapist and murderer turned himself in to the police on Monday. She was allegedly attacked after going to ask about a package at the local post office. Protesters held placards with her name and picture and circulated the hashtag AmINext on social media to raise awareness of the prevalence of gender-based violence. According to fact-checking organization Africa Check, the murder rate for women in South Africa is 4.8 times higher than the global average. It's estimated one woman is murdered every three hours. Reuters, Lorraine Anthony, with that report. Now, French Prime Minister Edward Philippe has unveiled measures to tackle domestic violence following the murders of more than 100 women by their spouses, partners or ex-partners. VOA's Lagza Hawk reports domestic violence is a worldwide problem, but many governments choose to ignore it. 
According to government figures, a woman is killed in France by her partner or former partner every three days. Sometimes women are killed because they stay with an abusive man. But many are killed even if they leave and report threats to the authorities. Such was the case of Julie Dwib, mother of two, who was killed in March by her former partner. She filed a complaint five, six times. I filed a complaint myself for murder threats five, six times. We were warned three days before her death that all the complaints have been dismissed. I don't understand why. Julie was the 30th victim of domestic violence this year in France. After her, 71 other women were killed. The growing toll has sparked public outrage and demands for action. French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe announced Tuesday that the government is setting aside an additional fund to create emergency housing for women who are victims of domestic violence. We know that women who stay with an abusive partner generally resign themselves to this due to a lack of material and financial resources to leave with their children. We will therefore mobilize an additional 5 million euros to create 1,000 new places for accommodation and emergency housing. 50 will be created in 2020 in emergency shelters to ensure immediate security. The Minister of Housing will also create 750 places through the mobilization of temporary housing allowance. This accommodation will be adapted for women who leave with their children. It will not be an emergency shelter in a collective structure, they can stay between six months and a year. Other measures include educational programs for dysfunctional families and the police dealing with complaints, as well as penalties for abusers. When partners or ex-partners make it impossible to breathe and then go unpunished, I am convinced that it is the whole society that is suffocating. It is then time to guarantee all French women the right to breathe, with or without their partners, so justice is done. Domestic violence is common worldwide. According to a United Nations study, about 30,000 women were killed in 2017 by their intimate partners, due mostly to a lack of protection for abused women. Zlatica Hoek, VO News, Washington. Pope Francis is traveling to Mozambique Wednesday to encourage the country's fragile peace. The pontiff is kicking off a three-nation Africa tour where climate change, poverty and corruption are expected to be high on his agenda. The Pope is expected to talk about peace when he meets Mozambique's leaders on Thursday. His first stop in a seven-day trip which will also take him to Madagascar and Mauritius. The former Portuguese colony emerged from 15 years of civil war in 1992, but it was only last month that President Philippe Nussi of the ruling Frelimo party and the leader of the Renamo opposition, Osufo Momade, signed a permanent ceasefire. Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg has taken her Friday school strikes to the gates of the United Nations, surrounded by hundreds of other young activists calling on adults to take action on climate change. Thunberg is expected to speak at a climate change summit of world leaders at the upcoming UN General Assembly. Here's VOA's Cindy Sain. A 16-year-old girl and her 14-day voyage across the Atlantic Ocean from England to America in a zero-carbon emissions sailboat has captured the world's attention. She was greeted with fanfare and plenty of questions when she arrived in New York Harbor Wednesday. It's strange. Everyone always asks me about Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, my message for him is just listen to the science and he obviously doesn't do that so I mean I as I always say to this question if if any no one has been able to convince him about the climate crisis the the urgency then why should I be able to do that so I'm just going to to now focus on on spreading awareness and that people in general will start caring and realize how big of a crisis this is. She started skipping school alone on Fridays a year ago to protest for action on climate change outside the Swedish parliament. She has since inspired more than 2 million children in 135 countries worldwide to take part in Friday school strikes. On Friday, Thunberg and hundreds of other young people staged a Friday protest in front of the United Nations. 
They called on adults around the world to join them in a worldwide climate strike on Friday, September 20th. Thunberg will address world leaders at the UN Global Climate Change Summit on September 23rd. The fires raging in Brazil's Amazon rainforest have given the climate change issue a special urgency for this year's UN gathering. Cindy Sane, VOA News, Washington. Coal-fired power plants are closing across the United States and Europe as market forces have shifted to cheaper natural gas and renewables. But in the U.S. state of Wyoming, where coal is an important part of the economy, the government is trying to put the brakes on the transition. VOA Steve Baragona reports. You'll find two kinds of fossils in the Wyoming town of Kemmerer. City Councilman Robert Bowen sells one kind at his fossil shop downtown. That's one of the fun things about some of the fossils is they tell stories. You know, like this guy right here where you can see the bite mark. The other kind is fossil fuel. A coal mine feeds the Naughton power plant just outside town. It's, it's huge for us for, you know, as far as our economy, that uh, the power plant, the coal mine uh, provide a lot of jobs here. Wyoming is the nation's leading coal producer, but the energy industry is changing. Dana Ralston heads coal, natural gas and geothermal plants at Pacific Corp, which owns Naughton. He says coal is more expensive now than gas fired electricity and renewables like wind and solar are moving in. You know, renewables have grown year after year after year and they are a cheaper alternative um, from a market perspective than a coal plant. Late last year, Pacific Corp announced that closing the plant ahead of its schedule would save customers money. Wyoming has not embraced the energy transition. The state's residents have the nation's lowest rate of acceptance that humans are causing climate change. And University of Wyoming economist Robert Godby says that state officials have not prepared for the changing market. We've been late to the game. We have been reticent or, or maybe just slow or maybe we've denied uh, the changes that are going on. And so we've been slow to react to them. We haven't been proactive. We've been reactive. We understand that a change is coming. But we're simply asking that let's do it with some wisdom Let's not put the plane into a nosedive. Let's let it glide down easy and sort this out. Dan Dockstetter is a Wyoming state senator. A new law that Dockstetter sponsored puts a wrinkle in Pacific Corp's plans. It requires the company to look for a buyer before closing the plant. Godby calls it a speed bump. If the current owner of a coal-fired power plant can't make money with that plant, why would somebody else buy it? But on the other side of the coin, the devil's in the details. Godby says the details are still being written, but the state may structure the deal to raise the costs for Pacific Corp. With that uncertainty, firms hate uncertainty, maybe they'll look at other states and close those power plants first. Robert Bowen says the new law will help the town of Kemmerer buy time, but trouble is ahead. It's not if, it's when. To prevent some of that, we need to start looking at diversifying our economy here. Um, one of the things that we could be pushing a lot harder is paleotourism with the fossil fish that we dig here, which is something that's very unique to this area. Bowen says fossil tourism alone won't save the town, but it would help. You get the scales and bones on both sides. Like the creatures entombed in stone here, Kemmerer must adapt or go extinct. Steve Barragona, VOA News, Kemmerer, Wyoming. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a nine-year-old Nigerian transforms into a video game design prodigy. We'll be back.
our voices, we're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I am Sheka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international recording talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. This pop-up restaurant in Cape Town is putting the meal into mealworms. This is the insect experience, believed to be South Africa's first restaurant to serve a full menu of insect-based dishes. Adventurous customers can try small bowls of insects, including mealworms and dried mopane worms already considered a delicacy in some African countries. The United Nations says insects emit fewer greenhouse gases and less ammonia than cattle or pigs and require much less land and water. Next up, women in the Central African Republic town of Birao are taking part in a farming project, one the UN peacekeepers running the effort hope will foster peace and bring communities together in a country that has faced sectarian conflict since 2013. The participants come from different women's groups and are trained on improved farming methods and financial management. The women then sell their produce, which includes vegetables and crops like cassava, at the open-air market once a week. And finally, the demand for rare whiskey is expanding in China, Hong Kong, and the United States which is why the market has become the perfect target for counterfeiters. But a new invention is hoping to solve the problem. This small piece of glass has two million nanoscale metal taste buds on it. The color of the metal taste buds changes depending on what whiskey is being tested. And then it builds a statistical flavor profile of that certain whiskey. The artificial tongue is said to have a 99% accuracy rate. And that's what's trending today. After devastating the Bahamas, Hurricane Dorian appears likely avoid la landfall in the U.S. state of Florida. But that does not mean residents anywhere else along the southeastern U.S. coast can relax. Forecasters say Dorian is getting bigger and will move dangerously close to Florida and Georgia during the day and into Wednesday night, then threaten North and South Carolina with massive rainfall and powerful winds. This is going to be riding Florida's coast for the next day, day and a half. Um, while we think this is a much better track than what we were looking at 72 hours ago, we just ask people to stay safe, remain vigilant. There will be some effects in the state of Florida. There will be storm surge. Uh, there will be some flooding. Uh, you, know, you may see wind damage depending on how close uh, this gets uh, to the state of Florida. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, being safe is, is the most important. Even if the center of Dorian does not make landfall in the Carolinas, it's likely to bring heavy rains and strong winds. Rainfall forecasts range from 7 to 25 centimeters in the coming days. Dorian finally drifted away from the Bahamas Tuesday, leaving behind devastation described as apocalyptic. Prime Minister Hubert Menes says 
There were seven confirmed deaths from the storm, but that number is expected to rise. We must now also show our love and charity in acts of generosity over the course of many months. It will take all of us as a caring community, government, church, businesses, and individuals to help restore the lives of our people. The U.S. National Hurricane Center says flood waters on Grand Bahama and Abaco Islands should start to slowly subside. Aid efforts are being hampered by the long duration of the storm as it hovered over the islands. The runway at the Grand Bahama Airport is underwater, and the Red Cross says that 62,000 people are in need of clean water. The United Nations says some 60,000 people will need food after the storm. Now, migrants and asylum seekers are crossing America's southern border with Mexico in record numbers this year. And the U.S. Border Patrol is crumbling to adapt. BOA's Ramon Taylor and Victoria Marquis report on the natural hazards border crossers face in what is projected to be one of the deadliest years for migrants in the region. You know, they'll pop out. This is mostly family units that would use this one. They come out to what they hope will be a Border Patrol agent waiting for them. As the number of migrant family apprehensions north of the Rio Grande surged to record highs in 2019, U.S. Border Patrol agents in South Central Texas felt the pressure. In the Del Rio sector, agents erected tents in the town of Eagle Pass. Some emergency medical technicians were diverted from the field to its processing centers. And in August, the agency opened an in-house health facility. This is the initial assessment room, so they would come in here, be seen, um, and the medical uh, team would give an assessment as to what they need. If they can prescribe something for them, they can treat it here. If not, then they'd send them over to another, another uh, medical facility. U.S. Border Patrol agent Alan Bell says his sector has apprehended migrants from more than 50 countries. Many arrived dehydrated amid extreme humidity and heat exceeding 42 degrees Celsius. Others don't make it. The International Organization for Migration reports that more than 500 migrants are dead or missing in the Americas so far in 2019, higher than each of the previous five years through the end of August. Roughly half of them occurred near the U.S.-Mexico border. The leading cause was drowning. It could carry you a half mile to a mile down the river. And then if you're, you know, lots of times you're using these, these swimming pools, and, and it, you know, it's hard to maneuver them and steer them. You're kind of just at the mercy of the current. Those who make it across recall tense moments. My daughter was crying. Water had reached up to her chest. She was in tears. Mom, I cannot. Then the soldiers on the other side told us, come, give us your hands. But while the dangers of crossing are evident to many migrants and asylum seekers, the alternative, they say, is worse. If doing nothing means you'll die or that something will happen to you, you'll do whatever it takes, risk illness and everything. What worries anyone more than anything is their kids. At least in my case, it's my kids I worry about. I would risk everything for them. Ramon Taylor, VOA News, Eagle Pass, Texas. It's time for our technology segment, and joining us now is our tech reporter, Paul Ndiho. Paul. Hello, Esther. Hi. How are you? A Nigerian boy has launched a hide-and-seek gaming app by using free programming application called Scratch. His mobile game, which is accessible online, features animations and storytelling. He has incredibly created over 30 games. Bessel Opera Jr. loves playing video games, but he loves making them even more. At the age of nine, he has created dozens of games. He called the first game a frog attack. Gamers shoot alien frogs that have attacked the earth. Frog attack is my favorite because it was my first game that I built on Gunshots 2 and it's full of action. Dessel has created 34 other games using a free coding application called Scratch 2, which allows users to create games, animations, and other digital stories online or offline. 
Earlier this year, Bessel's father signed him up for a boot camp called the Code Feast, where he learned coding, computer programming, and how to create mobile games and other skills. The boot camp targeted young Nigerians of 5 to 15 years old. I started coding this year, and it was a boot camp that taught me how to code. The name of the boot camp was Code Fest. And why I like to build games because the games are much fun to play. And when I play them, I feel like I'm the owner of a game. Leapfrogging into technological innovation is a quick way to attain lasting economic growth and development, according to some tech experts. Bessel's most recent game is Falling Apples, where a player tries to catch as many apples as possible, receiving one point for each apple found. During his spare time, he teaches other kid coders game programming skills. Like many kids his age, Bessel's biggest fan and inspiration is his father. When I found out that he's interested in technology, I was excited because I know that there is a huge potential in the technology industry around the world. You know, being able to write codes, being able to build things, being, being able to, to program robots, to program something to behave the way you want it to behave is very exciting. So I didn't have that opportunity growing up, so I felt like it was important to support him to do whatever he wants to do. Bessel has great potential to grow as a game developer, especially in Africa where only 16% of its 1.2 billion people use the internet, according to the International Telecommunications Union. That's a today's technology reporter. Back to you, Esther. Hey, Paul, that's the first in Nigeria. I mean, that kid is amazing. Is in, this the first one in Africa at that age to create games online? N not really, but uh, uh, his story is incredibly amazing uh, in a sense that uh, he has been able to inspire a lot, a lot of young people. As uh, I, I, If you watched in the package, there was a boot camp, and that guy was technically in charge of the boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> so wh wh what are you looking next in terms of technology next week? What are you planning for us? I mean, the sky is the limit. Uh, <laughs> there is so much uh, amazing stuff uh, coming out of Africa, and uh, every week I'll be bringing you something that is incredibly, incredibly uh, beautiful from Africa. Definitely. I wish I would do something like that, but now I'm past nine years old, Paul. <laughs> well, you can always pass on that to your son, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Paul, thank you again. Be sure to watch uh, Paul and Diho's uh, segment on technology every Wednesday on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.